I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. Nearly two years ago, Jason Kenney and the UCP defeated Rachel Notley's NDP in strong fashion. And while the government started its term ticking off campaign promises, economic recovery was slow, and then the pandemic hit. Now the government has been forced to adjust to economic slowdown and for now has abandoned its plans to balance the budget in its first term. Meanwhile, there's been growing discontent on the left and the right over the budget, COVID-19 restrictions, and more. This is shown in a dip in Kenny's public polling support, and not to mention the talk that some constituency associations want to see a leadership review. At the midterm, we talk the polling, what Jason Kenney needs to do to turn things around, and how Calgary is key to his electoral fortunes. My guests today are Dr. Dwayne Bratt, political science professor at Mount Royal University, and Dr. Lisa Young, prof- political science professor from the University of Calgary. Thanks very much for coming on the show. So to both of you, you know, we've we've almost reached the midway point of Premier Jason Kenney and the UCP government's first term in office. And while he rode into power on a wave of popular support. He had more than half the votes. He had nearly three quarters of the seats in the legislature. He's been faltering a bit lately. You know, Dwayne, what do you make of recent polling that shows the UCP trailing the NDP from anywhere between three points and 20 points? Yeah, so I believe the um, the UCP is is trailing the NDP, but I don't think they're trailing by twenty points. I, I have some issues with the the methodology of that particular poll uh, because it's an outlier. All the other polls show a slight lead for for the NDP, uh, and that's kind of where I see the, the 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 lay of the land. But this is still significant because ever since the creation of the UCP, they have led the NDP. Um, for years. And, you know, in the 2019 election, defeated them by over 20 points. So the fact that they're trailing mm-hmm. is is remarkable. And the other is you have to put it in the context of the pandemic. Most other Canadian political leaders have gotten a boost in their approval ratings, a boost in their poll numbers as a result of their handling of the pandemic, except for the Alberta government. So you can't just say, well, it's the pandemic and this is occurring to John Horgan or Justin Trudeau. In fact, it's the exact opposite. And I think part of this is the story of Jason Kenney. Some of it is about the pandemic, but some of it is not about the pandemic. And the other is Rachel Notley. And I think we need to acknowledge that as well. Lisa, from your perspective, is it a, is it a case, like Dwayne said, that there's something going on outside of just the pandemic that's that's causing some issues for Jason Kenney? Or is it a combination of um, some decisions or choices that were made in the first year of his term leading into the pandemic that you know, made it harder for him to receive a bump in support through the pandemic. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on here. And I I very much agree with Dwayne's analysis of, you know, believing the polls that show uh, the UCP to be uh, a little bit behind, but not the the 20 points. Um, But if we look really carefully um, at Angus Reid data, and they've been, uh, you know, polling on the same question um, ever since the 2019 election, what you see is that the decline in UCP support actually starts before the pandemic. So the UCP were at 40% to the NDP's, I think, 37% in February of 2020. And that was, you know, before any of us really, you know, knew what the pandemic was going to turn into. So there's something else going on here. And again, if, if you dig a little bit deeper into some of that polling data, what you find is that if you ask people in Alberta what you know, what issue is the most important to them right now? The answers are, you know, number one, the economy and number two, unemployment. So the pandemic is only third. So is the pandemic a problem for the UCP? Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's not helping at all. But if we think back to the 2019 election, getting elected on that platform of jobs, economy, pipeline, you know, the, the party has failed to deliver on that front and through, you know, f- forces beyond their control have ended up with this enormous deficit um, that doesn't play well with with traditional UCP supporters. And, and mm-hmm. building off of that, that deficit existed pre-pandemic. 
you may recall the February of 2020 budget before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There were significant problems with that budget. Um, their their calculations were, were out of whack. The deficit or the uh, the deficit from the previous fiscal year seemed to rise by a couple billion dollars between the February budget and the end of the fiscal year in March. So there were there were some problems there on economy jobs pipeline because right now they're zero for three. Uh, yeah, but then you've got the outside pandemic forces like parks and coal mining that we're not about the pandemic, we're not about economy jobs pipelines, and we're a self-own and a bad self-own. You know, through 2019, there were a lot of cases of, well, here's the things that you elected us on, we're doing them. How do you, where's the disconnect between voters and what the what the UCP uh, says they're doing or what they are doing? Lisa? Well, if I can jump in on that. Um, you know, I think the issue here is that they're not doing the things that matter to voters. There are some, you know, uh, hardcore supporters who are concerned about issues like recall. Uh, but the, the mainstream UCP voter really was brought to the party and and uh, motivated in the election by that promise of jobs economy pipeline. And as Dwayne has said, they're 0 for 3 on that issue. I think also, you know, one of the, you know, the art of governing is to know when to deliver on the issues mm -hmm. that got you elected and when to pivot, when to understand that the situation has changed, the world has changed, profoundly under your feet and and you need to bring new ideas to the table and i think you know because of uh the, the pandemic um it certainly has increased the sense that uh, alberta's ability to rely on uh oil and gas as you know the the major industry is time limited that there's a real desire uh, among the public, including lots of folks who would normally vote for the UCP or the right of center party, that we need to be thinking differently. We need to be thinking about a very different future for the province. And the failure to pivot and respond and, and govern under these new set of circumstances, I think, has really exposed the, the UCP, particularly in Calgary, where the next election is gonna be fought. One of the things that I think both of you have raised is the the things that really appeal to his base um, recall, killing the carbon tax, fighting the federal carbon tax in court, all of these things. They may keep his base around, but lately we've seen that there are there are portions of his base that are frustrated with him. And it is around the pandemic. The idea that, you know, we have these restrictions in place, you know, in, in smaller centers, places like Medicine Hat. Uh, where Drew Barnes is from, and he's frustrated with his own party. Um, do you feel that s some of these poll results speak to kind of a midterm frustration with the government? And so they're willing to answer that right now we're not happy with them and we may park our support with somebody else. But, you know, two years down the line, when it comes to an election, when people are looking at the ballot, they may say, well, you know, we made it through the pandemic okay. Um, I can't vote for the NDP. I don't really want to vote for the Alberta party because they don't have a chance of winning. So I'm going to go back to the UCP and, and what's safe. Dwayne, what's your take on that? So when you look at the polling numbers, a 41-38 or 41-36 lead for the NDP would likely lead to another majority government for the UCP, given the, the mm. huge support that they've got in, in rural Alberta and the small cities. The NDP gets 70% of the vote in Edmonton, great. They go from 19 seats in the city to 20 seats in the city. Um, you know, Maybe they pick up a couple in the satellite communities of, of Leduc or, or Sherwood Park. But the, if the UCP can pull off 30 seats or more in rural and small uh, small city Alberta, and there's 41 of those, then they pick up a handful in, in Calgary and they're, they're back in power. Uh, and I think you're right. A lot of the people that are parking their vote at the Alberta party that doesn't have a leader, that doesn't have a set of policies, that doesn't have a seat, that is just seen as, yeah, it's this kind of party and it's in between the NDP and the UCP. When push comes to shove, come election day, people are going to choose one one or the other. Um, and I think mm -hmm. they, a lot of the UCP people will come back in the fold because they don't want to see you know the raving socialists led by Rachel Notley in, in office. The threat 
to Kenny, though, and this threat has always been there, and it's one he recognizes is another right wing party. And you do have grow, you did have growing support of the Wild Rose Independence Party uh, after the Trudeau election. They've taken another step, though. They have become not just a separatist party, but the anti-social restriction party. And so you're seeing the morphing of this, you know, group. And that is the concern. And that's why you've got a group of dissidents within the UCP caucus led by Drew Barnes, but he's not alone. And why they have been allowed to speak and why they have remained in caucus is the fear that if they left, uh, that would give greater support to whether it was Wild Rose Independence or some other far right party. And that's the danger to the to the UCP. Lisa, you know, we have on the left, we have people who are upset about the fight with doctors, who are upset about the handling of the pandemic and, you know, not putting in a circuit breaker lockdown in the fall or people that are concerned about, you know, environmental uh, issues, parks, the coal mining issues. And on the uh, on the right, you have people who are frustrated with the government, who are cracking down too much, who, who uh, don't want uh, to see businesses go under and who are upset about the amount of uh, debt in the most recent budget and where the government is at in terms of deficit spending. When you look at how Jason Kenney may seek to kind of right the ship for the UCP, do you see him leaning toward one side over the other? Well, you know, I think what we've seen over the last six months or so is this incredible balancing act that he's trying to pull off. Because on the one hand, mm -hmm. you know, if, if a, as Dwayne has said, if a credible party appears on the right, then it, it starts to cause electoral trouble for the UCP. At the same time, if he moves too far to the right to appease the, you know, anti-mask, no restrictions uh, side of the, the, the populace, then he does risk losing those folks in the center. And that's where a lot of votes are sitting. And again, you know, I think all eyes have to be on Calgary. Um, you know, there are key ridings that will be in play. And, you know, you can see the, the balancing act that he's playing on, um, you know, pandemic restrictions, you know, moving a little bit in one direction, a little in the other direction, you know, just trying to, to find that optimal spot between these two uh, sets of interests. But it's a very difficult thing to pull off um, long term, particularly you know, what we're seeing right now is that there's sort of a public mood of, you know, frustration, you know, everyone's had at the end of the pandemic and, and, and so on. Now that might ease, but, you know, I think there's a lot of room for, uh, you know, the, the, the um, MLAs on the right potentially to rebel and, you know, give some credibility to that right wing party, which then presents huge challenges, I think, for the UCP. Mm hmm. Now, amid all this frustration with Jason Kenney, and it kind of really took hold in, in early in the new year over concerns that cabinet ministers and MLAs and, and staffers had traveled out of the country while we're all stuck in our homes, frustration over the budget and ongoing restrictions, we started to hear talk of a leadership review. The constituency associations wanted one. We heard rumors that even there were MLAs in caucus who wanted one. And so the party finally announced that we're going to have one but not until next year. Dwayne, why do you suppose that if they're going to have one, that they wait? Um, and does that leave Kenny open to criticism that he's out of touch with his base by pushing it off? So I have, I've called this a, a shrewd political move. Others have disagreed with me. We'll find out if Lisa does. But I think it was a shrewd move by saying, look, it's in our party constitution that there has to be a leadership review. We're going to adhere to that. We're a grassroots party. And we get to choose when that review will be. And we're going to choose the AGM, which will be in late fall 2022. So if you're upset and you want a review, that is your opportunity. On the other hand, it allows time for the vaccination to roll out. It allows for a time that there will be an immediate kickstart to the economy when we start to drop these social restrictions. Um, it, it puts time between those that are angry right now. And so I think it was, it was a shrewd move. Now, 
there could still be an emergency leadership review if enough constituency association presidents go on the record and demand one. But are they actually going to do that? Or is the handful going to look around at those that were waffling and the wafflers go, yeah, but we've already got one scheduled? Mm -hmm. uh, because the challenge is not necessarily winning a leadership review. You know, uh, Ralph Klein won a leadership review and he left. Joe Clark won a leadership mm -hmm. review with 67%. He left. Allison Redford won a leadership review with 77%. She left. For a leadership review, especially in the, uh, the, the front of an election, you better be at 90 or at 95%. Ask yourself this. Rachel Notley and the NDP were defeated in 2019. If there was a leadership review right now of Rachel Notley, what would she be at? 95 96, 97, yeah. it wouldn't be 80, it wouldn't be 85. And so if, if there was a leadership review with a secret ballot for uh, Jason Kenney right now, he wouldn't be near that. He would be, I think, in positive territory, but he wouldn't be where you need to be. He, that would greatly damage him. And that's why I think it was a, it was a, shrewd, uh, a shrewd move. Lisa, with the leadership review, do you, do you think it's, it's partly to just kind of put Jason Kenney, put some space between Jason Kenney and the pandemic, or is there also kind of a bit of good timing there because holding a leadership review in 2022 means the window between the leadership review and an election is so tight that, you know, if, they, if the numbers weren't great, they may just look to stick it out with him until the next vote because there wouldn't be time for a leadership race. Well, I think nobody wants to walk into an election with a, a bad result in, in a leadership review, you know, right behind them. But I think by the same token, nobody in a party wants to put their leader in that situation in the months before an election. So there's a gamble here that enough people, even if they're not fans of Jason Kenney, will want to win the election and will therefore, you know, vote in favor in order to give him the ringing endorsement that he needs to walk into this election and be successful. So I, you know, I'm inclined to agree with Dwayne that it's a shrewd move from that point of view. But I think we should note that there is a gamble that's in there, that the, you know, the, the dissent within the party can be managed between now and then. Mm -hmm. Now, looking, looking at the next two years and until the 2023 election, we're seeing the vaccination rollout really kind of kick up and potentially it could roll out before a third wave of COVID-19 settles in in Alberta and Canada. And if that happens, you see the economy reopen, you see people get back to work. You could see you know, just kind of a, just a natural bump in mood in the province without Jason Kenney doing anything. What does he need to do on top of that to kind of get things back on track? Or is it enough for those kind of two major things to happen for frustrations to ebb to the point where he doesn't necessarily need to worry in two years time. Lisa? Well, I think, you know, you're absolutely right to point to the economy and, you know, there, there may very well be a sense that, you know, things are getting better. There's a buoyancy and we know that incumbent parties do well under those circumstances when people think that, you know, the economy is going well. Now, there's a fundamental question here, you know, what will the price of oil be? Will frustrations over pipelines get in the way of this? Um, you know, there's, there's lots, uh, there are lots of things to trip over and, you know, Kenny has already given um, the NDP a lot of good material for their campaign ads, right? I think we'll hear a lot about the 1.5 billion on KXL that, uh, you know, didn't produce anything. So, uh, you know, th there are certainly dangers ahead, but I think that Kenny has to, you know, I keep coming back to this, but this election is going to be fought in Calgary. We know wh where Edmonton is mm -hmm. going to land. We know where rural Alberta is going to land. It, it's the Calgary seats that matter. And Calgary is really at this point of sort of existential, you know, what are we going to be as a city as we move forward? And I think Kenny wants to, needs to get out in front of that. And I think, you know, to be successful in contemporary Calgary, he's got to find ways to be more inclusive. If you look at those polling numbers, they're there is a 12 point gender gap and, you know, women mm -hmm. are not supporting the UCP and he is going to need some of those votes. So I, I think, you know, making a, a broader appeal, a bigger tent is going to be really important for Kenny uh, going into the next election. Dwayne, last word to you. What is what does Jason Kenny need to do 
to ensure that, you know, things get back on track? Uh, absolutely. The, uh, a successful vaccine rollout, which I think is occurring. I'm optimistic on this. It was about two months before we hit 1 million people in Canada vaccinated. It was about one month that we went to 2 million. It was two weeks before we hit the 3 million. We will be under two weeks to hit the 4 million. It is it is happening. But some of this is outside mm -hmm. of the control of Jason Kenney. I heard Jason Nixon yep. in an interview saying, you know, a successful vaccination rollout is due to the plan of the Alberta government. And if there's delays, it's because of the Trudeau government. You you know, which is a typical Alberta statement. Uh, but I think that will occur and that will lead to the opening of the economy and there will be a spur of activity. And to use a political science term, though, it is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for a re-election of Jason Kenney because there remains a structural problem with the Alberta economy. They are banking everything on oil and gas literally they uh, uh, their entire economic plan is around oil and gas they've created an apparatus that has embarrassed them in many respects around the war room and the allen inquiry and fighting biden and, and horgan but that's that's their game plan the world is changing though and I'm not sure the UCP has realized that. So even if you reopen hair salons and you've reopened restaurants and you've reopened sporting events, that will be economic activity, but not the sort of economic activity that they're really going to need to, to go forward. And the other is around the deficit. So what's going to happen as you start to get closer to the election of 2023? By their own law, they have to release a budget in February of 2023, just before that election. What does that budget look mm -hmm. like? That's going to be one of those, we're going to present a budget and we're going to run on this budget. Is Does yeah. that include a $7 billion deficit? Right now, they're projecting deficits across the entire spectrum higher than any single year of the NDP. Or do they decide that they are going to raise taxes to lower that deficit, which would uh, antagonize their own supporters? Or do they try to make even deeper public sector um, cuts, which they think the UCP supporters may think is really popular. I'm not sure mainstream Albertans do. So there are still challenges ahead uh, for the 2023 election, even with a successful vaccine rollout and reopening of the economy well it's you know i know it's a it's an old saying it's never boring in alberta politics i i can't think of a time where that hasn't been more true than right now Dwayne bratt lisa young thanks very much for your time pleasure Thank you. that's it for under the dome don't forget you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome also you can hit the subscribe button right there on youtube i'm dave breckenridge We'll see you next time.